whole concept of this conference is reaching out to communities that were kind of lacking in the room. I'll just say it like it is. And so we needed to hear these people. Um, I've already talked a little bit about Gabby. Um, Christine is in charge of the College Republicans. Wow. College Republican leader in Maryland. Yes. In Maryland. And Mr. Leonard here is a precinct captain, which is how I found out about him, because he was going door to door in PG County, if I'm not mistaken, and has a great story um, of a uh, Democrat who came, activist who came knocking on his door, and I'll let him tell that a little bit later on, but is also in charge of the teenage right. So, I thought we would bring you up some of the leaders, and, and we'll talk with them. Gabby? Well, it's nice to be back here speaking at uh, Turning the Tides. Um, when I last spoke here, I was like fresh out of college, just starting up. I've been at Leadership Institute for the past uh, almost two and a half years. I work with college students in the Northeast, so I travel on a frequent basis up there and work with a lot of conservative and libertarian students. But I wanted to preface my talk in saying that there should be more young people here. Um, I come from a conservative background, I think uh, my other fellow panelists also do too. And you guys should bring your kids to every event you go to or every election effort that you organize or participate in because if you don't include people of our generation, they're going to be lost and they're going to get sucked into this vacuum that is the government paternalism that the left is trying to you know, get everyone uh, entitled to. And so, uh, yeah, bring your kids here to functions like this and connect them with uh, us. Like, I'm probably older than my other two panelists. I mean, I'm in my mid-20s, but I'm still fairly young. I still have plenty of time <laughs> until my 30s. Um, but I started um, conservative activism when I was 18. That was about five years ago or so. In California, I'm originally from the uh, formerly Golden State. And um, I'm a child of immigrants who came here legally, so that's always something I'm proud to talk about. Uh, they worked hard to get here, and uh, citizenship is a gift. And um, I kind of have a lot of hats. Um, I'm a blogger, I'm an activist, I like fishing, I like shooting, all that type of stuff. And I juggle a lot. And uh, through my activism, I hope to inspire other young people. And I also am joined by my sister here. She works for Judicial Watch, and uh, we run two. <laughs> She's a very young person to talk to as well. And she and I have these two blogs, and I'll, I'll jump back and forth between my blogging and my work um, you know, activities. But we run two blogs, and actually my sister is blogging on behalf of Counterculture today, that are youth-centric, and we like to engage people and get young people involved in our efforts because too much of what is espoused today, especially even by some young people, is that it's very you know me 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 centered and it's not like we centered. We're trying not to be collectivist because that's counterintuitive. But it's an all inclusive type effort that we want to um, you know espouse and promote and getting more young people involved and giving them a platform to talk, share their story, share you know why they support Second Amendment or why they support marriage or pro life issues. So it's important to get more young people involved. And in my capacity as a regional field coordinator at Leadership Institute, I travel and meet with students. I act as a consultant. And here are some of their stories of how they've been persecuted on campus. And it's not an exaggeration. It's very true how many students are attacked and defiled on campus for being conservative, for being libertarian. I have one girl at an all-women's college that I work with, and she wrote an article exposing um, this one protest that didn't want white people uh, to protest you know, for Black Lives Matter in Massachusetts. And she wrote about that and was excoriated by her fellow uh, classmates for being you know, self-hating, privileged, all this. And she had to go to Alliance Defending Freedom to prepare for a prospective lawsuit because her safety was being uh, put into question. And another student that I work with at Brandeis University exposed this radical leftist girl's tweets and um, because she's, she has a lot of you know, cop-hating tweets you know, in relation to the Eric Garner case out of New York. And he's being threatened with lawsuits. Students are calling for his removal from school. It's ridiculous how many young conservatives are unfairly targeted. So Leadership Institute in our campus leadership program and also with Campus Reform. How many of you have heard of Campus Reform? Do you know what our website is? OK, a few of you, that's good. 
I hope all of you familiarize yourselves with it. It's a great outlet for exposing leftist bias. And if you have kids in college or grandkids in college, encourage them to send tips to campus reform. The reporters are exceptional young men and women. Um, our editor in chief, Caleb Bonham, is a great guy. He's always on Fox News. You may have seen him. Good looking chap uh, from Colorado. He's always talking about crazy stories. So if you can include your kids um, in that effort, or you know, with me, um, I don't handle Maryland, but I have a colleague that does. So if you want to talk about getting your kids involved in collegiate efforts, I'll happily connect you to some of my colleagues, or you can work with me too, and I can, you know, I'm, I'm based out of Virginia, I'm one of the few Virginians probably here, um, but happily uh, oblige you to assist here in Maryland. Um, so I don't want to take away any more time, but I'll give it to the next one. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. As, uh, as introduced, my name is Christine McAvoy, and I'm the state chairman for the Maryland Federation of College Republicans. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm so thankful that Tanya had invited me to come speak. This is actually the first time that I've spoken at an event um, outside of anything related to college Republicans specifically, so it's very exciting. Um, a little bit of background about me. I'm a junior at uh, Johns Hopkins University. I study public health, and I'm also pre-med. Um, and I, I originally have always been somebody growing up who was interested in politics and current events. And then as um, I got older and you know was inspired by what was going on with the 2012 campaign, I decided that when I got to college, I really wanted to be involved in college Republicans very actively. Um, I got to Hopkins, and like many schools on campus, uh, many many schools you find where the conservative presence isn't necessarily as strong as you would expect, which makes it harder to find them. Um, the College Republicans group is pretty small. Um, a group of us who joined it our freshman year grew the chapter a lot, and I became chapter president my sophomore year. And then at the end of sophomore year, I, became, I was voted state chairman. And since then, my focus has become uh, mentoring and developing the, what we currently have nine chapters in Maryland. Um, from west to east, from the, to the shore. We have tons of chapters so far, but we definitely want a lot more. Um, and I would say that one of the things that I've noticed the most is that while there's definitely you deal with, you know, what the College of Pope National Committee would do, something like hashtag my liberal campus, a lot of what uh, Gabrielle was talking about, is that there's also a great sense, I think, of students who just don't necessarily see much interest in getting involved in politics. Um, it's not necessarily whether they believe one way or the other, it's that they just, they don't pick college Republicans as their extracurricular they want to be the most involved in. And I think, because for example, I found a Republic, I found this girl, I was walking into the library and in the cafe, there's this girl with a big GOP elephant sticker. And I had never seen her before, but I saw her sticker. I said, oh my gosh, it's my best friend. I went over and talked to her, and I was like, oh, you should get involved in college Republicans. She was like, oh, I'm so busy already, I don't think I have time, which is understandable. But it's a little bit frustrating because I really think that being involved in college Republicans, no matter what you want to do with your life, is extremely important because, or being involved in politics in general, because, you know, when you graduate, you want to know how, how you can use your degree and what the workforce is going to be like, um, what it's going to be like you know, for in-state students living in Maryland. Um, it's a lot of information, and it's a, you know, you can study in the library, I know I do, I go to Hopkins. Um, it's, you know, students are working very, very hard no matter where they're going to school, and, you know, what are you gonna do with your diploma when you leave? And I think that having an understanding of what's going on outside of school is extremely important, and also what's going on on campus, and creating a respectful dialogue whether it's you know partnering with other student groups or hosting your own events, it's something that we really want to see increase more and more. Um, I think that you know students have reservations about speaking up politically for many reasons, whether they're afraid that you know they hear about what happens, if, what's happened in the past, or um, they think you know oh the media portrays politics as this, um, you know it can get scary. And I think that in my experience thus far in Maryland has been very positive in terms of the mentors um, I've found and the people who really want to support the college Republicans and I hope that everybody else would want to as well. That um, it's important and I think that it's extremely worthwhile and I'm very happy that I'm doing it. Um, 
And I think that you know, a lot of our members are as well. That's why they take so much time in that. You know, in large part, in order for the College of Republicans to grow in Maryland, it's not, it's, it's about the chapter and it's also what we can do as a state party in Maryland. So it really falls on, you know, we need help from, you know, what I like to say are the real adults. Um, what the people who aren't in college who can you know help support us, whether that's helping with fundraising efforts or partnering with, with chapters to host events, or you know if you live by a school and they don't and they're not listed as a chapter on our website, then let us know and we can maybe partner together to help build more chapters in Maryland because those sort of connections open opportunities which give students a reason to get involved. Um, so I think that's about all I'll say on that. Um, and I'll turn it over to Leonard. And yeah. Hello, my name is um, Leonard Robinson. Uh, I'm chairman of the Maryland Coalition of Teen Elephants. Um, I kind of want to go back to what Gabriella said. Um, when uh, she talked about younger people getting involved in politics, a lot of it is fear, mostly. Yeah. Fear based on uh, how they be viewed, you know, among other students. Oh gosh. But um, a lot of it from the high school level is the fact that at home they're not encouraged to think about political issues. And if they have different views from their parents, they're often shut down. And that's very difficult for me to understand because my parents are divorced. My parents are divorced since I was two. My mother's here today. She's right here. Um, and obviously she's been doing something for <laughs> and um, I was not raised in a Republican household. Um, my mother's a Democrat. Please don't jump her, she's my right home. <laughs> she is more than welcome here. <laughs> and my father's a Libertarian. So, um, I see some Libertarians in the back. But, um, <laughs> so it's always been interesting for me politically growing up. And while I might not agree with both my parents, on many issues, they've always been accepting and encouraging of my political development and my political activity. And that's one thing we have to think about when we think about younger people, particularly on the high school level. Because if we stop their thinking and shut them down and tell them they're wrong, then when they get in the college level, they get in this mindset that they don't matter, the voices don't matter. And it continues the cycle of voter habits where they don't vote. And that's one of the biggest problems we have in the political system now, is not only people voting for very crappy candidates, for lack of better words, but <laughs> not voting at all is a big problem, especially on younger people. I think that's all I have to say. Well, Leonard, can you tell your story that we, uh, that we posted about? Because I think they have to hear it. It's great. Okay. Um, there's someone here in this room. I can't see them. Every time they see me, they ask me to retell the story. It's become very popular. Occasionally in the grocery store, I might get someone that stops me about the story. But the story was, it was back in March of 2013. Um, it was one of those days, it was a snow day, but they canceled school, and it was a bad idea, because snow wasn't as bad as it was. And my mother was at work, and I get a knock on the door, and it's a local Democrat. Now, days before, I had been canvassing with Lee Hayes, who's here in the back, uh, and doing phone calling. And this person had heard of this and was coming along with an Obama t-shirt, declaring that she was from the Democrats and that to keep this neighborhood Democrat, she didn't realize it was me. And uh, long story short, we had an interesting conversation. I told her why I was a Republican. She's the first thing she had, are your parents Republicans? No. You know, so uh, she ended up walking away, never saw her, never saw her again, but encouraged me and many others to keep fighting harder. So, one of the things that I'd like to find out from you guys, um, Leonard, I know that you're just now kind of starting the, the teen elephants. How bad is it? Like, like how bad are our numbers looking? What can we do to help you? What can the people in here, Alex, where are you? That, that's a new one coming up. It's not quite the same see yet. Let me walk back here. Yeah, yeah, we talked about having your kids here, and we got a couple, we got a couple of kids here. Um, so how can we help you? Because some of us have kids in school. Some of us have grandkids who are in school. 
Um, how can we help foster that environment where it's okay to talk about politics um, without shutting, them, shutting down kids? Because that's very important. Everybody wants to be respected. Um, how do we do that? Well, number one, I think the first thing you can do is encourage your children to read. My parents always tell me to look at all sides of the issue, not just the one that you agree with. And um, it helps you, number one, debate why you, you know, agree with your side of the issue. But um, I think your first question was, how can we help? Um, number one is bringing your kids to these events. And number two, beginning with local people, you know, in starting clubs. The numbers are not that bad. There's not that many. Most young people, the only problem they have with conservatives is that social issues. And that's when most of the time they agree with libertarians. And because of this, Democrats put a mindset on young people that we're the evil Republicans. You know, they don't even say what they believe, but they say what we, we believe and why they're against it. So we're always on the offensive. I mean, on the defense, I'm sorry. Um, so we have to find a way to take us off the defense and pre present our ideas just as the Democrats do, without any negativity, with straight objectivism. Um, so telling the stories, which tend to be easier than telling the policies and, and stuff like that, get at the emotions, because we're yes. talking about teenagers. <laughs> yes, because young people care about emotions. They feel sorry for uh, people that are suffering. They don't like to see people suffering which is why they find Republicans unethical when we talk about cuts to welfare and private charity. You know, the Democrats program them that you have to care about poor people and the government has to care about poor people. And because we don't believe that necessarily, they view us as evil. So uh, that's just a few things. And Christine, can you tell me about, you said that there are nine chapters. First off, we want to know what those chapters are. You can go to the website, maryland.crnc.org, and that's our chapter list. I can also just name them if you want me to. Um, we have chapters in the Baltimore area. We have Johns Hopkins, uh, Loyola, and Towson University. We also have uh, University of Maryland College Park, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. On the shore, we have um, <coughs> Washington College and Southford University. And then St. Mary's College of Maryland in the south, and then in the west, Frostburg State. Okay, so those are chapters. Did this thing. And when I was in college, I was in a sorority and also on a team, so I did not have much time. But the sorority would meet monthly. What does it look like on the college campuses? Are you guys meeting monthly? Are you guys different from chapter to chapter? Is there stuff where we can help? Maybe some of the some of the people in here can help bring guests to some of those meetings, what kind of things can we do to help you out? So this past fall is, I think, slightly different because it was an election season. A lot of what we were, what the chapters were trying to do, and some of them had great volunteer turnout for the elections. Um, I know on the shore, people who are coming from the shore, Southburn and Washington College did a lot of great work. Uh, the University of Maryland had well over 20 people turn out through phone calls for Dan Bongino. Um, yeah. Yeah, we did, a, we did a lead actually to off that quick tangent. Uh, one example of you know great partnership between campaigns and um, the college Republicans was with Dan Bongino. We did a Google Hangout um, because we knew that Dan had visited some of the colleges the year before, but this fall we wanted to make sure that the students you know got to know him and you know former Secret Service agent. Yeah, let's talk to him and hear what he has to say. Um, so what we did is, you know, Dan didn't have the time in the fall of 2014 to go to all the different colleges again. So we hosted a Google Hangout where either the chapters met up together to um, ask him questions and hear about the campaign and his views, or, you know, people could watch individually too. So there's a lot of ways in terms of harnessing social media, because that's where all the kids are, um, to be able to reach out and, you know, I found I was trying to see where there might be some new chapters, and so I was watching the Hogan for Governor twi twi uh, Twitter feed, and I saw there was a kid at Hood College who had a Hogan um, sign on his door, and I said, oh, their chapter, you know, dissolved, so why don't I go try to find it? And so it's, it's things like that, where social media is a good way where you can, you know, also find, you know, people uh, who agree with you and people who disagree with you. Um, but it also depends on going also on the idea of fear of talking about, you know, 
what your views are is that you know we live in a judgmental world where you know you say one thing wrong and you know it could get scary and you know you have to be really understanding of that and I think going along those lines what we're trying to do is in Maryland is really build leadership and look at being involved in college Republicans as an opportunity for students to really become leaders in leadership development um, but to go back to the more specifics of how often we meet um, it really does vary school by school. I would say on average, and what's worked, I think, the best would be chapters meet every other week. Um, they do like to have speakers, so definitely if you know of a group who might be interested um, in speaking, you can definitely reach out to the chapters. Um, so I do keep in mind, definitely contact them first. Don't just show up. Like, that's a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> no hard feelings for the people who have, because there was actually, you know, <coughs> Some people, there was one, one or two people who showed up to a meeting once and I was like, oh, I don't know they were coming, but it ended up being a very, very opportunity that they had. But definitely, we have all the contact information, um, and you, it's very easy to contact the chapters. So, great. And we do a variety of things. It's not just, um, you know, meetings. Uh, some chapters go on like gun range trips. They might take, um, they sometimes they go out and campaign and door knock, but a lot of that stuff we brought on campus, so we did a lot of on campus phone banking this past fall. Cool. Now, I have a question from the audience that I love. How do we, how do we as old farts, talk to young people? <laughs> so, Gabby, I'm going to hand that over to you because you have a little bit more experience. Sure. How do we talk to young people? That's not an impossible task to do, but unfortunately, a lot of the people who are more seasoned than uh, all of us here up on the panel, <laughs> um, especially those in the establishment who, and I mean, I don't know if the other panels go, but I, I'm more conservative with a lot of libertarian leanings, and our organization, um, we, we coalition build. We don't shy away from those who are more Republican, party-based, um, but we do hark on being more ideas-based. Um, but as to how you can talk to young people, don't be afraid to boldly articulate conservatism. A lot of the times, people misconstrue, especially young people don't know what conservatism is, and it's because of spokespeople who don't know how to articulate it. So they're very confused, or they think it's this far-fetched, ridiculous, radical notion that we want to take away birth control, or take away rights, or do all this other stuff to actually suppress freedom when that's the opposite, because conservatism is rooted in freedom. I mean, my family, um, I mean, having them you know, come from the former Soviet Union, we are a very liberty-minded family. We don't like any government intrusion whatsoever. So I think striking a chord among young people in issues that would um, intrigue them, and I don't believe you should shy away from social issues. There is a way to talk to young people about pro-family views, pro-life views, because this is a pro-life generation, and people still do care about the institution of marriage. It's just a matter of how you promote it. You promote it at the local level, through cultural means, get people involved that way, because so many young people are disillusioned by the dating culture, facilitated by radical feminism and all that. You can get people, even on the left, to um, sympathize with you on certain moral issues, if you just know how to articulate it properly about the hookup culture, um, the lack of monogamy, this whole polyamorous, you know, multiple partners, garbage that the left is pushing through now. So there are ways to um, connect with young people. I mean, one really hot commodity is Uber. How many of you have used that before, that service? Really? Not many of you have used Uber before? It's a wonderful, um, you know, shared service. It's a great alternative to the regular unionized taxis. And a lot of young people like that because it offers choice, consumer choice. Um, freedom, it's a lot cheaper than taxi fares, and if you talk to them about those issues of why free markets are better or why supporting conservatism will allow you to advance in your career, that's how you'll be able to resonate with them. You have to personalize the issue, because if you don't personalize it or add your story or why you successfully you know, benefited from conservative and libertarian ideals, young people our age are not going to resonate. Like I try to uh, share my family's story and and show that you know you can come from an immigrant family and be successful and have, live the American dream and even benefit from that as a first generation American as my sister and I have. And, and just sharing your personal story of why you've succeeded or why you've you know overcome hurdles or went from rags to riches or went from you know non-religious to religious, 
Um, whatever issue you're talking about and trying to get people um, interested in, if you personalize it, that's the best way you can get them on board. Um, it, it, you can do it through social media, blogs, um, functions like this. Um, there are many ways. You just have to talk to people like myself, my sister. There's a whole network of young people, really good activists. I'm lucky to be friends with some of the best and brightest young folks. Some people work for Senator Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Mike Lee, and a lot of people. And if you come to DC, I live in Alexandria, and I'm fairly approachable. A lot of people are. If you want to be connected to certain young people and have them come speak to your respective groups of functions like this, or regular meetings or whatever, I'd be happy to connect you. There are so many resources you can tap into, you know, people who know how to get the message out there to young people, and kind of um, using them as a springboard, um, learning how to better articulate. And come to my office. We do great trainings on how to promote and articulate conservatism. So that's one way. Gabby, can you tell us um, about one or two of your favorite programs that happen at Leadership Institute? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, one of the primary trainings that we offer for young people is the Youth Leadership School. I'm not sure how many of you, have you taken it? Yes. Oh, wonderful, that's superb, awesome. Yeah, Len, I guess Len has taken it, and uh, did you, you benefited from it, you enjoyed yes. it? Very good. Get your kids, they can be high school age, college age, even young professionals. Um, it's a great boot camp for learning how to get involved in grassroots from a youth perspective. Um, it's a two day long seminar training. Um, I completed mine, I think about five years ago. It's been so long, oh my goodness. Um, it's intensive, but it teaches, it teaches um, participants to learn how to manage campaigns, how to um, organize groups on campus, and how to um, essentially outdo the left um, through youth politics or on campus. Um, I can definitely explain that to you on an individual basis if you come up to me. Um, another great program, um, it's not really youth-centric, but we just hosted this. It's the Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast. It's a great way to network with conservatives in the, in the Mid-Atlantic, or DMV, I should say. Um, they happen every first Wednesday of each month, and it's a great way to hear from speakers. We've had Senators Cruz, Lee, and Paul um, come. We, have, we recently had my sister's boss, Tom Fitton. Um, and that's a great way to network, to learn more about the Leadership Institute, and also just to see what programs we offer for um, adults, young adults, and anyone. Um, so I, I think that's also a program as well. Excellent. Okay, just so you guys know, we are almost time for our um, Q&A, so if you guys want to start lining up, that would be fantastic. Oh, hold on. Jim, we're going to need a bike down there. Actually, we'll just go ahead and jump straight to it. Go ahead, Lee. Yeah, I'm Lee Hamish, uh, Prince George's County. I appreciate working with Leonard a lot. Very frustrated work trying to work with young people at the University of Maryland. It's the largest voting precinct in the Prince George's County. Overwhelms us with Democrats. I'm on the local. Central Committee in Prince George's County and trying to organize. I've been, I've been up to young Republicans, or college Republicans in Johns Hopkins. There are serious problems, and I want to not have time to run one question. How do you penetrate the students to get them organized? Uh, I, you know, I reach out to them. We have a local club meeting. They don't seem to be so interested in the local show. What happens is they register. They vote for these kooks out of emotion. They have no connection to the local community to care about what's going on after they leave, and they go away. So I'm trying to break through that, and I'm frustrated. I'm really glad that you're expressing your experiences thus far working because with the College of Republicans chapter meetings, that is actually really important, working with colleges in general. And, um, one thing that's actually great that happened at College Park is um, starting this year, uh, this we Maryland chapters started ordering uh, chapter boxes again from the College Park the National Union, a lot of free swag. So at the uh, student activities fair for freshmen at um, College Park, we actually they had over 300 people sign up because um, they thought you know they saw this table with you know ironically free handouts, um, <laughs> and it was it was. Great stuff, and it's so college. nobody can afford anything except noodles and noodles. That's a very that is also an extremely good point. So, um, 
What you're voicing about getting the students involved in the local politics is definitely one that we've seen across the board and one that we are actively working on um, trying to break through that. So I definitely agree that we're working on that. The greatest way to do that is to continue to engage with the chapters and with the students. Um, and if you're having any problems with that, you're welcome to reach out to the Federation level about it. Students at the universities that I go to, they want to go to Connecticut, they want to go to Virginia, they want to deal with the problems in, in Iraq. Uh, getting them involved in local, I'll tell you, the one area that I, I wish that there was some help with, maybe Gabby knows a little bit more, how do you, the fraternities and sororities seem to be the great untapped opportunities. They're well organized and they're largely very conservative. Is there a, is there a way, have, have you, either of you found a way to, to get them involved? They seem to be kind of organized. Maybe there's an opportunity there. So in Maryland, um, the chapters, as far as I'm concerned, haven't really reached out to fraternities and sororities that much, but what I can say is that the College of Republican National Committee does have a field rep program every election cycle, and when they send their field reps to swing states, a lot of them do touch base with fraternities and sororities and build relationships with those, go give um, presentations to a group of uh, fraternity brothers and sorority sisters, and they have seen some success in that, and that is something that chapters could explore doing going into the future um, in Maryland as well, and I think that going beyond fraternities and sororities, there are a lot of different student groups, non-political, um, that college Republicans chapters can um, coordinate with. For example, last year um, at Hopkins, we uh, partnered with the, uh, this is still a little bit political, but with the Foreign Affairs Symposium, um, FAS, the Foreign Affairs Symposium, and uh, for an event that they hosted John Bolton. And so that was a great opportunity for us to help get our name out and recruit more people by partnering with other student groups. So you do raise a very good point that looking at fraternities and sororities, those are one of the many groups because, you know, in college there are so many clubs. I don't remember, you know, when you guys were in college, how many clubs there were, but there are so many clubs at club fair that, you know, there's just so many choices. So you kind of have to say, okay, maybe if automatically students aren't gravitating toward college Republicans, especially if or um, want to get involved and come to our events, and learn more about what we believe in, that you know, partnering with other groups that all might have smaller pools um, is another great way to do that. Yeah, and piggybacking off of what Christine said, um, what we encourage um, conservative, libertarian, pro-life, pro-gun um, groups to do, since we are a 501c3, we can't explicitly work with CRs, but we do help CR groups coalition build by creating partner organizations, and one of the things we encourage um, activists to do on campus in our respective regions is to have them coalition build with as many like-minded individuals or potentially like-minded individuals. So um, it is very important. And it's just all about um, having you know, having an anchor on campus and uh, penetrating as many groups as possible and being on top of things and, and uh, being on the offensive when the left is on attack. And that's very um, problematic sometimes. But it's, it's feasible. It's just people are lazy and they don't want to do it. And Kathy? Well, I want to thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm Kat Fuller from Carroll County, and I know it's uh, difficult to be a college Republican, especially an outspoken college Republican these days, and so I applaud you. But um, I think that we miss the boat a lot, because in this room, we all have our own access to our own youth. And often, we don't bring our reasoning to our own youth. And I think we need to recognize that we have to start in our own families, whether we have kids, whether we have grandkids, nieces and nephews, in, you know, in the workplace if we come in contact with uh, you know, adults or kids. And I think that we often don't take the opportunity to express <coughs> why we think the way we think, not just this is how we think, but why do I? This is my reason. Go with me through this path, and this is how I get from here to here. Does that seem reasonable to you? And what I I have two kids, recent graduates from school, from high school, and now um, college age. And uh, what we often did was we talked a little bit. I I find something that was really hypocrisy in the newspaper, and I'd bring it to the dinner table and I'd say, listen to this. Now, does this make sense to you? And we just kind of have a you know, two, three-minute conversation about it. I have one child, 
who is very politically minded. It's easy to talk to them. My daughter, she doesn't want anything to do with politics. She's bored of it. But I'll tell you what, she understands the issues. She doesn't necessarily, she doesn't have the motivation because that's just not her thing. But she understands where we're coming from. She is a conservative. She's not active and outspoken. I'm sorry to say, but she is a conservative. So I just want to say to the parents and grandparents out here, don't miss opportunities in your own area of impact because then you might empower your kids to be these kids. It's important. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, just to build off that a tiny bit, that it is that there are a lot of people who aren't, you know, necessarily extremely outspoken, and you know, those people are important too. And so, well, it might seem like on the surface that it's a smaller number of people because they're the outspoken ones, but there are more. And I think you raise an extremely good point that continuing dialogue and learning about the issues is extremely important, and that's you know a very easy way to help build and. Um, awareness, you know, for what we believe in. Um, my parents made sure that I was straight-laced growing up because I have a few cousins who are very liberal-leaning. One cousin is married to the grandson of, like, a flaming communist who did, uh, she went on a tour with that radical singer who died, Peter Singer, I think, or something. So I forget his, I'm probably butchering his name. So he made sure that my sister and I were very conservative and I mean, even if uh, your kids, I would hope they're conservative, but even if, let's say, you weren't, or if um, you grew up with parents who are not conservative, um, you should definitely begin discussions of why conservatism is important. Just by bring, um, bringing up like day-to-day -day actions, I mean, Ronald Reagan said that all great change in America begins at the dinner table. Every day, I remember growing up, um, my dad and mom would always talk about the day-to-day -day issues, like, did you hear this? You know, even if we were too young to comprehend, they wanted to make sure that we were engaged, alert, uh, conscious of what was going around. Um, and growing up in California, it was always eventful, so you always knew what was up <laughs> growing up there. Um, so just engaging your kids, even if they're my age or young adults, um, still kind of keeping them on the leash, like, same-wise. Um, and having them engaged, and even if they're not political, um, you should remind them that politics does affect every aspect of life. And if, you know, your newly graduated grandchildren or children you notice that a big chunk of their paycheck is gone to taxes, you can explain that this is the consequence of big government tax taking policies. And you can even um, make them uh, understand that through those basic means, even if it's not through like, well, this is bad, this is bad, but uh, simply by articulating, you know why uh, higher taxes and all these regulations and more spending is deleterious um, to, to their personal life too. So you can lure in people and, and keep them engaged by personalizing, as I mentioned before. And I mean, even just in day-to-day -day activities, like when I go fishing with my dad or I go shooting at the range, he always can still have discussions about life and the importance of value and freedom. And so just keeping your kids engaged and alert and, and cognizant of what's around them can keep them in check and not make them fall prey to the left side ideology. I'm going to say this with a story, very quick story. Um, I was sitting at the dinner table one day with my father when I lived in Louisiana. He lives in Louisiana. And um, he gave me a copy of his pay stub. And I looked at where it said taxes and all the deductions. And I'm like, God, where did your money go? And he's like, now you see why I want to abolish the IRS? <laughs> But it begins with talking to your kids and bringing it to their level. Bringing it to where it affects them. Not so much on your level, because they're not there yet. Younger people, high school students, don't talk about economics, because we don't have jobs. We don't work. We rely on you. Mom, when's dinner ready? <laughs> so, you have to bring, when you're talking economics and even social issues, to how it affects them now. That's all I have to say. I think that sounds like a great homework assignment. Everybody go home and show your stubs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question, please. This might be slightly off topic, but um, I'm an active member of the American Legion Auxiliary in Frederick, where I live. And we had a young lady come in who we had sponsored to go to Girls State this past summer. And she is a first generation uh, American Muslim. And her comment, her parting comment to us was from participating in Girls' State, 
she learned more about how our government operated than she ever did in high school. So I want to encourage all of you, it's a nationwide program, Girls State, Boys State, fully paid for by the American Legion in your area, to, for children, students, high school students to go to learn how the government works. Um, thank you guys for doing what you're doing, and I just, a little kind of parting smile. My daughter is a senior at the University of Tennessee, is a deaf education major. And she sent me an email, and it was a t-shirt, and she said, Mom, this is all I want for graduation. T-shirt said, I survived college without becoming a little. <laughs> Fun fact, I'm actually from Tennessee, so I don't know if I said that before. <laughs> All right, I got a question for you guys. So, what are you doing for uh, 2016 and 2018? Uh, what steps are you guys taking to make sure that, um, you know, Christine, that the college Republicans can stay involved, um, can phone bank, can actually get out there and uh, hit the ground with people like me that are working on the campaigns? Yeah, so basically what we're doing right now is our focus is primarily on growth and on growing not only the chapters that currently exist and then expanding to more schools. Um, so that's basically very growth-based, because you know we like growth. Um, so that is, in a nutshell, what we're planning to do. Um, if you want to ask more specifics on some of our plans for this coming spring, and, you know, looking into the future, then you can definitely reach out to me afterward. Um, I guess in terms of what Leadership Institute will do, um, we are trying to identify more students. We have a field program every fall where we um, train young professionals, those who are newly graduated, those who are taking time off, to go into colleges across the campus to help us um, in our recruitment efforts. Um, so we have that every fall, that won't change. Um, I believe we, we have trainings that train people who want to run for office in the future, um, learn how to manage campaigns. We have a wonderful training called the Campaign Management School that takes place at our headquarters in Arlington. If you're looking to help manage a campaign um, in 2016 and beyond, that's a great way to start. Um, and I guess for me personally, um, we, Virginia is kind of lopsided in our election year, so I'm going to try to do my best to campaign for on an individual basis, not through LIs. Capacity, um, but try to help people there continue to organize the grassroots movement there because it's pretty conservative state. But with McAuliffe in charge and all the other idiots, <laughs> um, we want to ensure that we keep Virginia fairly mixed or more uh, red leaning because I don't want to have to move again. I moved from California to Virginia. I don't want to have to pack my bags or go to Lithuania or something like that where my parents are from. So I'm going to try to do my best to do that and also um, continue my blogging efforts. But if you do want to. Um, prepare for future elections, do take Leadership Institute trainings. I cannot tell you how much those will benefit you, your children, anyone else who's involved in the political process. Uh, that's the what I would suggest. Excellent. Okay. I have one more quick suggestion for um, campaigns if you're looking for students that like to be fed. <laughs> there you go. Pizza. Pizza. Um, the team at Hello Pennsylvania will be looking for growth, so bring your kids. If I come back next year, I'm invited. I would like to see more kids. Um, personally, I'm working on a book, writing a book, so that's what I'm doing personally. So that should be done in 2016. Maybe I'll put it off. Okay, that's when it's done, we'll do a book signing with you. <laughs> okay. Amy, do you have something? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Uh I have a question for Leonard. Um, as a as a Black American. Um, we've heard oh, a lot. This is coming. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering what kind of reception you get um, within your community, within the black community, as a Republican. I think so maybe two years ago, when it was um, election season, and it was President Obama versus Mitt Romney. Um, in the primary, I supported Ron Paul. Um, yay. <laughs> but, um, during that time, it was a very dangerous time to be a black Republican. You were always looking at the sellout. It was always, you wanted to lose the opportunity for the first black president. Well, the second opportunity for the first black president. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I forgot about Clinton. <laughs> well, Clinton was the first black president. We're all black, and we don't have a diversity. <laughs> but, um, now it's becoming more and more 
question. It's more question. Why? It's more interest. It's not as much criticism. South Carolina did send black United States senator. Um, we do have other strong black conservatives fighting, and their names are becoming more recognizable, and people are more, more interested. I think the black community is opening its eyes more with President Obama who has six years, if I'm right, six, I've lost count, I'm trying not to count. I think they realize that you can't look, you can't look at race as the only factor, because at the end of the day, he's America's president, not just the president of the black community. And if he was, he'd be doing a terrible job at it. Exactly. Thank you guys so much. We greatly appreciate it.